at President Dean on the internet everywhere to stalk me. Um, I'm going to be talking about rail security as indicated by the title of the talk. Uh, quick announcement though, there was another security talk scheduled in the same time slot. Uh, everything has changed about that talk except the room. So the title changed, the presenter changed, and uh, the time changed, but it's in that same 204 each. So if you're like, oh man, uh, I wish I were going to that other security talk, you can still go to that talk and sit through this one too. So, uh, just wanted to make sure you know about that. In case you're wondering like what my credentials are to stand up here and talk about uh, security, um, and if you came to this talk wanting to know how to hack, I got it right here for you. I figured it out uh, late last year. Turn off the lights in your room, turn on the backlight on your keyboard, and start hacking. That's all there is to it. Uh, if you came to this talk to learn how to hack, you're done. Okay, I hate agenda slides, but I thought I would do one anyway. Um, because I want to make sure that you know what this talk is going to be about. This is not going to be a talk about the OWASP top 10. It's not going to be an in-depth talk of how to hack rails or anything of that nature. This is really kind of a, a very broad overview of what Rails gives you security-wise. What it doesn't give you, that's actually the bigger section and uh, is really more like me complaining about what it doesn't give you. And then a very short section at the end about, um, I don't know, what to, what to do about this situation. All right, what Rails provides. So, first up, cross-site scripting. You always have to start with cross-site scripting. Rails 2, who's using Rails 2? Yeah, see, never goes away. <laughs> so, back in Rails 2, uh, kind of a bad situation. You had to make sure you manually escaped everything in your views. Rails 3, everyone rejoiced. Escaping was the default. Uh, yes, I'm sure some people were upset that they had to go through and like remove all those H's from all their views, but this is like way better from a security standpoint. Everything gets escaped by default. In case you're unaware, uh, this is what it looks like to write views in Rails. <laughs> um, if you don't do anything, it's escaped. If you use raw, it's not escaped. If you use .html save, it is not escaped. What happens when you don't escape things? You get cross-site scripting. My favorite one looks like this. This is a super neat attack calling alert one. That's my favorite one. Uh, a little bit more complicated, you may have seen this. Quite embarrassing, middle of last year, uh, TweetDeck had an XSS problem. Someone managed to fit this script into a tweet, um, affectionately called part tweet. And essentially what it did was it would click its own retweet button. So if you saw this tweet in TweetDeck, it would retweet itself. As you can see down there, uh, about 84,000 retweets. <laughs> when this screenshot was taken, um, and I, well, I don't know when this screenshot was taken. It was during the whole incident. Um, and that part is not actually extraneous, it's the key to the whole thing. And uh, I can tell you about it later if you'd like. Uh, if you want to scare yourself and your friends, you can use Beef, which stands for Browser Exploitation Framework. Uh, it's not related to me in any way, but uh, it's actually a rail, not a Rails app, sorry, it's Ruby. I believe it's built on Sinatra. And uh, you can do horrible things if you find cross-site scripting on the site. Check it out if you're interested. Rails gives you a lot of like pretty safe helper methods, which you should use. It's kind of nice. Um, you don't have to look, like write a lot of HTML by hand. But you can see, although that's not true, actually, you do. But you can use these tags. Uh, they're safe-ish. Uh, I can't vouch for their total safety. Certainly, things like content tag or other sort of generic tags, where you just drop in your own HTML, probably not very safe. You should be careful. All right, XSS. I love this example because it's the example everyone uses for cross-site request forgery. 
you have your website, or your, your bank website open in one tab, you go to some evil website, makes a request to your bank, and yeah, just transfer some money. Now, I want you to notice, though, that my bank account has so much money in it, I wouldn't even notice if 100,000 disappeared. <laughs> so, you know, but other people, you know, they probably care about that amount of money. Um, does anyone find, like, this attack kind of strange? Like, why can one website make a request to another one and, like, it affects your logged-in session? Is that weird to anyone? It's kind of weird to me. Does anyone know the answer to why that happens? Or why does this even work? Yes, who said that? I like you a lot. <laughs> the one word answer is cookies. <laughs> yeah. So your cookies get sent along, so if you're logged in, the request will be as if you're logged in. You're probably all aware of this, but I just want to make sure that we're on the same page here. So Rails, out of the box, it's offered this for a long time. It's really nice. Gives you CSERF protection. I'm going to say CSERF because it's way shorter than cross-site request forgery. Um, the fancy term for this is synchronize your token pattern. Uh, you have a token in your session. You have a token in the form. When the form gets submitted, you validate that the token in the form is the same as the one in your session. It probably came from that user. You're all good to go. Kind of looks like this. You probably all know this. Uh, add some meta tags to your page so you can pull it out in JavaScript if you need to. Use the form helpers. It gives you this hidden input with an authenticity token. And it all just works. It's all great. Other frameworks would, I mean, some other frameworks would love to have this kind of thing. Other frameworks have other tools. Mass assignment, it's awesome because everyone knows about it because of GitHub. And it's sad for GitHub but it's good for the Rails community as a whole because people found out, hey, this is actually a problem, not just a cool feature. So this was the old way. So just drop your params in and save. And if you do that, someone can drop in uh, like admin equals true, and it sets it on the model, and now they're, they're in <coughs> So now we got to revisit some history. OK, so Rails 2. You could whiteboard blacklist the attributes that you can mass assign on models. Then in Rails 3.1, uh, it became an option that you could pick to say, all my models must have a whiteboard. That was a nice improvement. Rails 3.2.3, um, if you generate a new app, then that configuration was set to true by default. Also very nice. Rails 4, strong params came along. Now you have to wipe this on assignment, which is also pretty good. Um, I mean, there's different philosophies. And if you still want to use the old way of whitelisting it on the model, there are gems that will allow you to do that. But all in all, this is like, like this is good stuff. Uh, and it's moving in the right direction, right? Toward safety. That's the way we want to go. Looks like this, you probably all know. You can require a parameter, you can permit a parameter. If anything else than that comes in, it's not going to work. Uh, Rails, by default, will use a cookie, cookie session store, which means all your session stuff goes into a cookie. In Rails 2 and 3, that was a signed session cookie. It's nice, so use the secret value, signed it, and basically, yeah, even though you had this cookie sitting on your machine, you couldn't really change it, right? Because that would be really bad if you could just arbitrarily set values in your session. That would be quite bad. Rails 4. They switched to encrypted session cookies, which is also like a good move. And they switched to using JSON, not marshalling and unmarshalling. It's also a good move. So again, we're moving in the right direction. These are all good things. I'm telling you all the good news up front, right? Uh, SQL injection protection. I actually just like saying injection protection. <laughs> injection protection. All right. so. Rails 2, 3, you have your nice parameterized queries. That's the way to do it. Everyone knows parameterize your queries. Um, Rails 4 introduced RL or ARL or ARL. Um, as far as I can tell, if you use that, it's safe. Like, I haven't, and I could be wrong. If you're here and you know that I'm wrong, please like let me know. 
uh, so I stopped saying that. <laughs> but it seems like it's pretty safe. Like if you build your queries using that, it's basically safe uh, from injection attacks. So cool. Rails will give you all these nice nifty security headers. So X content type options set to no sniff so that uh, Internet Explorer doesn't try to guess what content type you're sending, uh, which always ends badly. Uh, x frame options set to same origin so no one can iframe you and perform quick jacking attacks. XXSS protection turned on, set to block. Tell the browser, hey, like if you happen to implement automatic XSS protection, use it. All good things. If you set force SSL to true, then you'll get HSTS headers, which basically tell the browser, hey, never use uh, a plain HTTP connection to connect to me. Always use SSL. Even if you click a link that isn't SSL, use SSL anyway. So that's nice. Oh, we got through that pass. <laughs> All right. Um, so like I said, this is kind of, um, this is mostly me complaining, and hopefully you take some of this. I'm hoping that people here will take some of this and say, I'm going to commit fixes for this to Rails, and everyone will be happy. Back to cross site scripting. I'll give you a moment to read this slide. <laughs> Okay, um, terrible naming. If you think no one gets this wrong, you are wrong. I have talked to people and they said, oh, it doesn't make it safe. So, I mean, you gotta think about someone coming into Rails, they, they've never used it before. They see this method, looks like it makes it safe. It doesn't make it safe, makes it unsafe. <laughs> uh, this, I just found out this week, I don't understand it. If you understand it, uh, please let me know because I'd like to be wrong. But it looks like even in the latest Rails 3.2, it does not escape JSON when you call to JSON. Um, I, I don't understand, but if you do, please let me know. Rails 4, it's, it's awesome. It encodes it with the like backslash U, and it's totally safe. And, uh, on, the, on the client side, it doesn't matter. It's interpreted the same, but it's safe from cross-site scripting. You know what would be really nice, though? Is if we had contextual encoding. Because who knows what all these methods do? There's one called sanitize. <laughs> sanitize what? From what? To what? I don't know. I mean, I do know, but you can't tell from the name, right? And then you have like HTML escape, escape once, escape JavaScript, escape once, escape, like cgi.escape. I don't know. I mean, I do know. <laughs> right? It, could you guess what it does? Probably not. You know what's nice though? Contextual in, encoding, which tells, it can tell where you are on a page, if you're inside a tag, if you're in JavaScript, if you're inside an attribute, and then it does the proper escaping. It's really cool. It would be nice if someone would implement it. CSERP protection is pretty awesome in Rails, but it's not as awesome as it could be, right? So you have to make sure that actually you're using post or something like post. Um, so if you're using git, you know, you don't need protection. And you have to make sure that you don't even allow git, right? Because just because your web app is using post doesn't mean the endpoint will accept a git. If someone sends a git request, you don't get CSERF protection. Another thing that's kind of, you know, just Fact of life is you got to use the form helpers if you want those automatic tokens ins uh, inserted. Otherwise, you got to do it yourself. Another thing to be aware of: CSERP tokens persist per session, so they kind of hang around for a while. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but you can kind of imagine that you might want that to be less long lived than a session. Maybe. What happens when there's a failure? When you get a token and it doesn't match what you expected? Um, these, if these look like odd version numbers to you, they did to me too. <laughs> so, Rails 2 through 3.0.3, .3, it would raise an exception. You know, and you've probably seen it. Rails 3.0.4 through 3.2.21, which is the latest, uh, 3.2, 
It calls a method called handle unverified request, and then it just resets the session. But the request still gets processed. It's just the session gets reset. Rails 4, the default, if you generate a new app, is to raise an exception. If you don't give protect from forgery options, though, it goes back to this, oh, we'll just clear out the session. So what? Why, why am I talking about this? Imagine you had an awesome method like this, where all I'm doing is taking the parameters and transferring monies. Um, I believe the transfer of monies looks like this or something. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a bank. Um, so there are two links down at the bottom. The first one was uh, from GitHub's bug bounty. They just published it this week. They had they paid out a bounty because of a bug where they were actually caching the session. So Rails would clear out the session, you know, like when you actually use the variable session. Uh, that was cleared out, but they cached those values somewhere else, so it did no good. The second one is a blog from Invisium from last year in, a, in some client's code. The client had implemented the sessions in a totally different cookie. So it wasn't in the Rails session cookie, it was in some other cookie. So yeah, I cleared out the Rails session cookie, but not the one that they were actually using. So that's bad. I mean, ideally, uh, when you have this kind of failure, just stop the request. Like, why would you ever want to continue processing your request when it seems like someone's performing an attack? So, raise exceptions. Yeah. Speaking of sessions, uh, this one still blows my mind. Server-side sessions are not the default. And you may be saying, yeah, but Justin, like, cookies are so fast and they're so lightweight and it's awesome, I don't have to have a database. But did you know that when you install Rails, you have to install a database? <laughs> so we're using the least safe default, which is using sessions, or sorry, using cookies for sessions, when we could just be using a database because you have to install one anyways just to like run Rails new. Uh, so what? Well, Rails session cookies are forever. If you get a session cookie, and we're talking about using the cookie store here, um, it, it lasts forever, it's valid forever, unless you, you code something on the server side to deal with that. Otherwise, they're valid forever. Um, the probably even bigger problem, though, is that you can't manage it on the server. You want to tell your user, hey, you have like five sessions and one is in China, and you're in Atlanta. That's something you'd like to tell your users as a security feature, but you can't because you don't know what cookies are out there until they actually get sent to you and you have no idea. By default, this is the default thing. Pre-Rails 4, when cookies are encrypted, uh, they're super simple to decode. So if you came to this talk and you're like, I want to be a hacker, if, you, if the, the keyboard in the dark thing wasn't good enough for you, here's the second step. This is, how, this is how easy it is to decode a session cookie from Rails. You just split it because the second thing after the dash dash is the signature. We don't care about that. Base64, decode it, load it with Marshall, boom, there's your session, right? And that's the whole, like, that's like the major problem with storing sessions and cookies is that you may accidentally put something sensitive in it. And that would be bad. Uh, probably you're not actually putting this stuff in it, but you never know what someone's going to put in a session. So, that kind of sucks. Uh, this one. So, who here has a Rails app and it doesn't have a user model? It does not have a user model. <laughs> I'm seeing like less than 10 hands. <laughs> okay. But Rails doesn't have any like account management stuff built in, except for it has secure password, which I, you know, okay, <laughs> it's good to have. So it's kind of crazy that that's not built in to me. <coughs> It'd be nice if it was. No authorization framework. I guess you can, you know, build stuff with your before filters. Um, this is an even bigger problem though, that Rails doesn't provide you any protection against directory traversal. So it will happily render any file that you give it, uh, no matter where it lives. 
And you can send any file, you know, if you have code that looks like this. And remember that it's when you render a file, it's actually executing your code. So keep that in mind. Uh, this, though, depends a little on your server setup. Your web server itself may actually have this kind of protection. Hopefully, you're limiting what your Rails app can actually access, uh, those kinds of things. But out of the box, it doesn't give you anything. Am I complaining enough? All right. <laughs> and again, this isn't because like I'm trying to dis Rails or anything. Does people say dis still? Dis Rails. <laughs> Just made me feel really old. Okay. Uh, well, because I'm hoping someone will fix it. Um, and I'm hoping that someone's not me. So. Anyway, uh, I double checked uh, last night. All these methods are uh, vulnerable to SQL injection on the latest Rails. You may be surprised because they look very innocuous. I made a website, rails sqli.org. It lists a whole bunch of uh, methods, active record methods. Uh, with some example queries, and you can go look at it and see what not to do. But what a lot of people don't realize is that you could clone that, and you get a Rails app, a very horrible Rails app, where you can plug in whatever queries you want, play around with this, and it gives you sort of like, okay, this is the code that's going to execute. Uh, you can put in the parameter value for uh, you know, for this parameter, and then you can run it and see what happens, and check out the query and see the results and just kind of play around with it. The site hasn't really been updated for Rails 4. I went through, I think, with 4.0 and updated some things. <coughs> what I would really love is someone else would go through and update it with like Rails 4.2 information, um, because there may be new methods, or there may be old ones that are gone, or there may be old ones that have now become safe. It's possible. So just go there, download it, send me a pull request, that would be awesome. This is the most begging I've ever done in a talk, by the way. <laughs> but sometimes queries are so complex that you can't use the uh, SQL methods that are provided by Rails. That's a joke about this query. Okay, all right. Um, but you know, like sometimes you end up building these giant strings, and um, you know, you're like, well, like, how do I even like sanitize this input? So you might like go and look at the docs and be like, well, sanitization, that sounds good. And you know what else sounds really good? Sanitize SQL. That sounds like exactly what I want. <laughs> So you put it in your code, because you don't actually read the docs. That's important. You don't read the docs. Just put it in your code. You put it in your code, and you run it, and any guesses what happens? Nothing? More than nothing. I added a method. What happens? You get this. All right? Undefined method. Uh, but let's say you, you did a little bit of digging, and you're like, ah, what are, it's on the class. All right, so I'll just get the class and call sanitize SQL. What happens? Does anyone know? Private method. Wow. You got that, but not the first one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So protected method. All right. Oh, we're Rubyists here. We don't believe in protected methods. All right. <laughs> So, you're right, this is protected method. That sucks. Okay, if they don't give you an API, just make your own. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's try this out. We're going to have classic SQL injection input here. We're going to pass it into sanitize. Bets on what happens. What happens? This is the most interactive part of the talk. All right. No nothing. one knows, because who knows what happens? Wow. Correct. Correct. Nothing happened. <laughs> Why? Because you didn't read the docs. <laughs> it's actually expecting something like this. OK. Uh, if we do this, what happens? It works. It's not fun, so I'm not going to ask you. Uh, this is what escaping single quotes looks like in SQLite. Just kind of doubles them up. 
So, uh, okay, we got that working. Uh, there's also this form, which gives you like a slightly different query, but that's cool. Um, that was way harder than I think it probably needed to be. And probably some of you in here are like, yeah, but that's because you were in an instance method. If you were in a class method in your model, that would have worked just fine. Uh, you're probably, probably totally correct. But I mean, come on, I just look, looked up the method and tried to use it, and it was really hard. That should be better. Easier stuff. Rails has no rate limiting built in. You got to do it yourself. Uh, open redirect protection, really awkward. Um, you could like use URI parse and get the path, but actually you have to do something more like this because it'll raise an exception if it's not a valid URI. And you don't really want to do this everywhere in your code. So I wish there was just a safe redirect. That would be nice. Who in here is a Rails core committer? <laughs> okay, well, it would be nice <laughs> if you change that. Uh, <coughs> does this look familiar slash dangerous to anyone? That home URL probably came from user input, and therefore it's not safe, and it's not escape. Yeah, it's not safe, but I'm sending it to link too. Isn't that safe? <laughs> <laughs> Only the text can click on the JavaScript Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the protocol isn't protected, so someone just put this in, and as soon as you know, someone clicks the link, there you go, XSS. My favorite one, which is alert one. <laughs> Uh, Ryan Helmkamp did a blog post and a couple talks, apparently a couple of years ago, I didn't realize it was so old, uh, about uh, Rails insecure defaults. So there's a whole another list of things that Rails doesn't give you, uh, some of which have changed and some of which haven't. So you can check that out. This is my cat. You're all waiting, where's the cat picture? When's he going to show us his cat? I know you were. Yeah. You can follow my cat on the internet, at Makoto the cat. He's very lonely, he wants more followers, so he asked me to throw him in here. Okay, to wrap this up, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly because um, people probably have questions or corrections that they would like to shout at me. So, what to do about it. First step, learn about security. You've all taken the first step. Congratulations. Good job. Next step, fix all the things that I just mentioned. That would be nice. That would be nice if someone did that. Uh, that would be really nice. You can use some libraries. Um, these, this is not like a comprehensive list or even necessarily recommended libraries, but these are some libraries that exist that you might want to check out. Uh, Rack attack for rate limiting. Secure headers uh, for secure headers. Uh, but in particular, if you want to add content security policy to your site, which you do, you can ask me later about it if you want. Uh, access control, you're probably familiar. There are libraries for that. Everyone uses OmniAuth and Device, so you're familiar. Um, that's a good idea. Um, you might want to use some static analysis tools. There's one called Breakman. I don't know. It's kind of good. You might want to try it. <laughs> um, some guy wrote it. I don't know. Uh, Bundler Audit is also very good for checking your dependencies for known vulnerabilities. And uh, it'd also be kind of cool if more people sort of jumped on that and contributed to the, uh, I didn't look it up, so I forget the name of it, but the Git repo that it actually pulls the vulnerabilities from. Um, I think that actually needs more people pushing stuff to it. Nice thing about static analysis tools. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a graph like this. There are, I don't know, at least 50 of them on the internet. And they all kind of look like this, right? And the idea is on the left, you probably can't read it because they're all so small. On the left, that's like when you start developing. You're doing your planning, your design, that kind of stuff. On the far right is you've already deployed. And the graph is the cost of fixing problems at any point along that graph. Problems could include security problems or other bugs, but we're in a security talk, so security problems. If you fix it way on the left, no, yes, the 
left. Uh, it's cheap, right? Like if you are typing code and then you backslap, backslap, you know, backspace, backspace, and then like type new code, that costs almost nothing, right? What about like you're in a design meeting and someone's like, hey, maybe you don't do it that way, you do it the safe way. What did that cost? Almost nothing. That's awesome. That's a, that's when you want to do it. At the other end, is when the code's deployed and you're at home asleep on the weekend at 1 a.m. You get paged, you have to get up and fix the security vulnerability. The cost is through the roof, right? Uh, not to mention, you know, if users are affected and the business is affected and all of that stuff. So cost is very high. The point is, you want to fix stuff early as possible. Nice thing about static analysis, and again, I'm biased, but um, the nice thing about static analysis is you can do it really early. Um, this is a plan that we kind of came up with at Twitter, which is where I work, which I didn't even mention, but. Um, sorry, forgot. Uh, this is the plan that we came up with. It's not a bad plan. Plan was use static analysis so that we can do stuff early. Look at all the code all the time. So before it ships, right? That's a good thing. And then my my personal favorite: uh, don't fix vulnerabilities, prevent them from ever happening. Right? So catch them as early as possible. Just get them out of the code. Don't ever ship them to protection to production. That's the ideal. There's some options for doing that. Uh, you could use something like guard or guard breakman and run, you know, as soon as you change code and save a file. It's pretty cool. Uh, you could get it into your commit tools somehow, commit uh, commit hooks or something. It's a good place. Um, <laughs> continuous integration, maybe with the Jenkins plugin for breakman. It's not maintained though. So just be aware that people tell me it still works. Or you can just, whatever continue integration, continuous integration you use, it's really easy to throw breakdown in there. Lots of people are doing it, it seems to work well. And then if you can kind of get into your release process somewhere, like maybe right before code ships, you run breakdown on it, or run your audit, or some other tool, that's also good. So just some options for you. If you're interested in more about that kind of thing, this is extremely self-promoting, but you can watch these two talks that I either gave or was involved in. The first one was at Netflix, and it's really short, and it's a good, like, condensed version of kind of lessons learned with trying to get security into the software development lifecycle and stuff. Uh, and the, the one on the bottom is the one that people got really excited about a few years at um, conference. Myself and my coworkers talked about uh, automation stuff. And if people really like it, you might like it too. That's it. Uh, be safe. Um, I'm at President B, at Brickman, and you know, don't spread it around or anything, but we're working on a commercial version of Brickman. If you're interested, come talk to me. That's it.